Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Could you, would you stand and sing while, while the rest of the group's coming? Number 314, everybody knows it. It's called Down at the Cross. Love it. 314. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood of thy glory to his name. Oh, glory to his name, glory to his name. There heart was the blood applied glory to keep singing name i am so wondrously saved from sin jesus so sweetly abides within there at the cross where he took me in glory to his name sing and Glory to his name, there to my heart was the blood applied, glory to his keep name, oh precious fountain that saves from sin, I am so glad I have been there Jesus saves me and keeps me clean, glory to the blood of light. Glory to His name. Give me time to wipe my nose. <laughs> yes. Last verse. Come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast thy poor soul and save your feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to his name. Sing it now. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood of life. Glory to in Jesus, my Savior, forever. He sought me and bought me with His redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew Him, and all my love is to Him. He plunged me to victory. Beneath the cleansing flood. Amen. Amen. Yes. Praise God for victory. Amen. Yes. I was thinking about those scriptures that uh, Christ was, was speaking. He said, you know, soon the world will see me no more, but you will see me. And I was thinking about that. And how is it that we see God? We see the stirring, amen? We see the manifestation of His Spirit in our services. And I was thinking how it's been. We've had a, it's been a good week thus far, amen? And I thank God for His, the moving of the Spirit in the services. And thank God for uh, stirring our hearts. And isn't it wonderful to know that God is active, amen? He's not just a, a far off somewhere, but He's very active and He's present. And so we have one that we can run to. Uh, amen. And we can look forward uh, this night. Amen. To what God's going to do tonight. I'm thankful that he wasn't done yesterday. 
and that it's over with. But I'm thankful that we can come tonight and, and expect something fresh and new from the Lord this evening. So uh, we're excited about what God's going to do this evening. We're thankful for yes. Brother Worley and for the yeah. preaching that he has done. And we can show that appreciation tonight during our offering uh, because tonight is a love offering uh, for Brother Worley. So you want to make sure uh, that uh, that God gi uh, that you give as God lays on your heart. Amen. Now we've got some prayer needs that we want to remember this evening. Sister Lewis had surgery uh, today. Uh, was that today, Brother Tony? Did she have that surgery today? Oh, is it, it was the surgery she had before. Okay, I just want to make sure I got that right. Okay, Sister Lewis has had surgery in the past there, but anyway, she's, uh, she's in a lot of pain, so if you would, remember Sister Lewis in prayer. Uh, also, Sister Goss's sister-in-law also uh, is in need of prayer, so you guys remember her tonight. Uh, then also, remember Sister Judy tonight. She uh, just needs a touch from the Lord, So, uh, and sometimes we just need an encouragement as well, so we just pray that God lift her in spirit and in physical body. Maybe just smile and open raise hand tonight. You'd like to make your needs known. Amen. So many things going all around. Amen. All right. Brother Bob, if you would come and anoint the service in prayer tonight. Bob. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you one more time, God. We have the privilege to gather into this house. My God, we know people all over the world don't have this privilege, Father. But, oh, God, we're so glad that you've afforded it to us, God. We thank you, Father, for each and every one of our brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you, Lord, for all those ones that you've picked up and healed in the past, God. We're thankful, Lord, that you have everything we stand in need of in our bodies and in our soul, Lord. We're so thankful, God, that you saw fit to send your son to bring, it, to bring something to mankind that man needed so badly, Father. We thank you from the deep of our soul. We thank you, Father, for this gathering place. We thank you, Lord, that you've afforded us these facilities, Lord. Oh, God, where we could gather together and bring our friends and our family, Lord, and be able, Father, to hear the gospel preached. We thank you for good pastors and teachers, Lord. Oh, Father, it's so great, my God, that you have given us all these many blessings of life. Father, this evening as we gather here one more time, we ask God your blessings. Father, upon Brother Worley, Lord, that you'll anoint him tonight, God. Father, you'll move upon his soul. You'll bless his life, God. You'll give to him the words to speak, Lord. May your Holy Spirit, God, so anoint him, Father, to bring forth the word of God, that, Father, it would uh, find lodging in every heart, God, that's in this building today. We ask you, Lord, that your blessings rest upon the spatial singers, Father. Be with the choir, Lord, as they sing, we pray in Jesus' name that you'll anoint the singing, Father, that it'll reach the hearts and the lives, God. You know the message that's in those songs, Father, and those ones, God, that were inspired to write them, Father. And oh, God, that same Holy Spirit, Lord, works through them every time, Lord, that they're brought forth. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessings upon Pastor Tony. Oh, God, upon uh, Brother uh, Hensley, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name you'll bless him. Father, we ask you that you'll guide and direct us in everything we do. Father, we might honor your name with all of our life and all of our living, Father. Bless those around about us, Father. Bless our friends and our neighbors, Father. Help us to know how to minister to them, God, how to witness to them, Father, that we may be able to lead them in the right way, Father. Be with us now throughout this evening. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This, this is not a real traditional song, but, but that Brother Ramey brought it over here to us, <laughs> and it kind of stuck. It's called, yeah. I'm Rich. Amen. I'm Rich. <laughs> you need to make the poorest rich, you know. It's like being in jail and knowing God. <laughs> you're, not, you're still free. 
Praise yeah. his name. Amen. My father owns a cattle on a thousand hills. I believe I own at least one. I stand amazed when I see his face, just knowing that I'm his son. Cause I'm rich in faith and hope and love. I've got more than my share. I'll be moving to my mansion just over in glory. Well, I'm a rightful heir. I've got a guardian angel watching over me. He'll go everywhere. But when I need my Father in heaven above, I pray just a simple prayer. Cause I'm rich in faith and hope and love. I've got more than my share. And I'll be moving to my mansion just over in glory. Well, I'm a rightful heir. Aren't you glad tonight? Think about it. Oh, he has redeemed and forgiven me for all of my sins. He took me in. He's given me his blessings beyond compare. Hallelujah, I'm a millionaire. Cause I'm rich in faith and hope and love. I've got more than my share. And I'll be moving to my mansion just over in glory. Well, I'm a rightful heir, and I'll be moving to my mansion just over in glory. Well, I'm a rightful heir. In heaven, clothed in glory and majesty, is the Lamb of God, now clothed the King of kings, through his precious blood we have stand now forgiven he has made us his people to reign eternally
Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And he made us overcomers too. Number 265, while we take our special offering this evening. I, I didn't realize the words of this um, song. It says his yoke is easy. I wasn't referring to the preacher. Hard job. Hard job. But Jesus' yoke is easy every time. Yes. I found my Lord and He is mine. He won me by His love. I served all my years of time and dwell with Him above. His yoke is easy, His burden is light. I found it so, I found it so. His service is my sweetest delight. His blessings ever flow. No other Lord but Christ I know. I walk with Him alone. His streams of love forever flow within my heart. I found it so, I found it so, His service is my sweetest delight, His blessings ever flow, He's dearer to my heart than life, He found me lost in sin, He calmed the sea of inward strife, and bade me come I found it so, I found it so, His service is my sweetest delight, His blessings ever flow. Listen, I've tried the road of sin and found its prospects all deceived. I've proved the Lord and joys abound more than I could. I found it so, I found it so. His service is my sweetest delight. His blessings ever flow. Amen. Brother Chad has a song. Thankful to be here, scheduled to go to work at 7 o'clock this, this morning, or this afternoon, and uh, got a text at 6, don't come in until 10.30, I said, well, good, I can go to church. <laughs> so thankful for God and what he's done for me. Um, one thing I've noticed, Brother Paul, about every time he chairs the service, he's, he, he mentions the phrase, so thankful we have a, a God that we can run to, and Run to is the phrase that I'm talking about. Um, there's a song by Colin Ray. When I was a teenager, it's called In This Life. And I had just recently uh, got saved, and God gave me different words to that song. Changed the words to it. So listen, listen for that phrase, but I'm going to try and sing that for you. With all I've been blessed with in this life, there was an emptiness in me. I was imprisoned by the power of sin, but on my knees you set me free. Let the world stop turning. Let the sun stop burning, 
Let them tell me you're not worth running to. If it all falls apart, I will know deep in my heart the only thing that mattered had come true. In this life, I was loved by you. For every raging river crossed. For every mountain we have climbed. Every raging river crossed. You were the answer that we long to find. Without your blood, we would be lost. Let this world stop turning. Let the sun stop burning. Let them tell me you're not worth running to. If it all falls apart, I will know deep in my heart the only thing that mattered had come true. In this life, I was loved by you. In this life, I was loved by you. Amen. Thank you, Thank you. Have a trio before the message tonight. Thankful for a great big God that we can put our faith and our trust in tonight. Listen to the words of this song. You're worried about tomorrow and what the future holds. Your mind is filled with questions as you face the unknown. You spent so many sleepless nights trying to work it out. Yeah. Worry has consumed your face with all its fear and doubt. But worry ends where faith begins when you put it in God's hands and leave it there. Oh, Still in control, so trust in Him and take a hold of faith again. For worry ends where faith begins. Why should we ever worry? Why should we fret at all? When worry only hinders the mighty hands of God, He said it is impossible to reach Him with a faith. So lay aside your worries, walk on in Jesus' name. For worry. Trust in Him and take a hold of faith again, for worry ends where faith begins. For He's still in control, so trust. 
trust in him and take a hold of faith again. For worry ends where faith begins. For worry truth in that. Again, we're grateful for Brother Worley. Amen. It's been a good week thus far. And we're looking forward to what God's laid on his heart tonight. You guys welcome him with a hearty amen tonight. Amen. We'll do it again. Maybe we'll get him up this time. <laughs> it wasn't loud enough. <laughs> That's right. You come on, Brother Worley. That'll God bless treat, you, man. man. Appreciate it. Thanks, Pastor. Oh, man, I love you guys. I appreciate you so very much. Um, I could spend my allotted time, whatever that is, and try to use wisdom tonight, but I could use it all just telling how grateful I am, how humbled I am, what an honor it is and has been to serve as evangelist for the first leg of this meeting here this week. Uh, you have been kind to me. You have shown your love to me. I know you've whispered prayers for me. I appreciate the fine accommodations at the motel down the road. Uh, brother, one of the perks of preaching revival in, here at this church is Brother uh, Bartlett is a, is, a, is a wonderful, wonderful host. And he, he takes me places and feeds me more than I ought to have, um, sacrifices his time. He's a busy guy, a lot going on. I, I feel bad. I, I tell him every, almost every day, I say, now, Brother Bartlett, I, I can fend for myself. I'm, I'm okay. You know, if you have things to do, no, no, he said, I'll be over and I'll grab people, pick you up. And he, he just, uh, he did a great job. And I appreciate it, Brother Bartlett. And uh, I had I had a meal or two with, with his good wife and just had a, a great time. And uh, the Hensleys and, and others that, at, in the evening. Um, and I, I just can't express enough my appreciation for the, 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 uh, sacrifice uh, that you've made to come for this for all of the singing the great choir uh, the practicing coming early putting the music together uh, to help support this effort uh, you just do did a fine job um, and for every one of you I pray God will bless you probably better to me than I deserve but I appreciate you doing it anyway <laughs> And I pray God's richest blessings on you as I leave tomorrow morning early. I'll be in prayer for this church often as I'm back home and my life unfolds to whatever end God would have it to be. And if God wills, we may cross paths not too many weeks out, really. I mean, I know it's July, but this is the end of April, so it won't be long. And you guys will be setting up for camp meeting. Boy, how the time just gets away, so... Look forward to that. It, yep, I didn't turn the mic on, man. See, uh, okay, we good? All right. That's because I didn't put it down early enough, and so when he was trying to get me up here, I was trying to fumble around, and oh, man. If you have your Bibles, I'd like... Uh, wish for you to turn with me to the book of Amos, chapter 8, Amos chapter 8. This afternoon was the only afternoon that I wasn't with Brother Bartlett. He, he had intended um, to pick, meet up with me again. We were together this morning a little bit, but I told him I couldn't. I just was not ready, and I was in just, I've been all over this Bible every which way. And I thought, well, maybe they'll just sing and pray and testify tonight. <laughs> I won't have to preach. But in the event that didn't happen, and it hasn't, I had to try and get ready. 
So I did everything I could to get ready, went over it, brought it, sat down, come early, look at, scanned it, folded my Bible, sat there, and then the Lord said, that's not it either. <laughs> that, that's not it. So here we are. Let me preface before I even read the text tonight with where my mind is and where I feel like God's going to take me. This church is no exception on some level by the effect of what's going on in the world around us. This is a spiritual church. The standard for living is the bar is set high. You have many people that ascribe to that, adhere to that, and live that, and do it well. But you and I know very well that as time goes on, there's one thing that remains the same. Change. And I know tonight, there's not a one of us that doesn't want this church to change with regard to our doctrine, our morality, and the things that we espouse and we put forth. I'm not suggesting they're about to. I'm not suggesting they, they may or ever would. But sooner or later the younger crowd's going to come up and they're going to start taking the, the reins. And so as much as anything tonight, this is, a, this is something that I hope will be, it is really for every parent who has children still at home. This is for every grandparent who has the influence to whatever end over your grandchildren. And for the great-grandparents amongst us to consider what are we going to leave the generations that follow us. I think the wisest thing any generation can do is reflect often on what are we doing to set up as well as we can the things that we want to leave our successors. We, we address the finances. We address a number of issues. Our children's education. Their health care. And, and all number of things. But it's quite easily to forget. The most important thing we can do for our children. Is to ensure that they'll have a place of worship that maintains, retains the integrity of truth and spirit that we had in our lifetime. Now we can't help, I won't be able to help what my children do after they bury me. My influence, well my influence isn't over, but verbally, and it, I could never interact, so it's pretty much subdued and subsided to whatever, to that end. But I don't want this to be, I don't want to be an alarmist tonight. I'm not going to use cheap threat, theatrics and scare tactics to try to motivate you to any, to any course and into any action. But I'll do the best to lay out with a few scriptures what I think is important by virtue of recorded history and what the Bible has to say. And when we, when we consider that, to do everything we can to ensure that that's not what we leave our children. Because I believe that our text tonight is very relevant to where we are in America and in the world at large, and even in Christendom. In a Amos chapter 8, three verses, beginning at verse number 11. 
Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land. One nation under God, in God we trust. This nation was founded on the principles. Our freedoms were won by prayers to a sovereign, eternal God. All of the things that define us by our religion historically is very much at risk. And in spite of all that, by our parents, our grandparents, our great-grandparents, and all those from the beginning when they landed at Plymouth Rock. God nonetheless says, quite possibly, as he did to Israel, I will send a famine in the land. Not a famine of bread nor thirst for water. I don't believe this, this America with our technology, the fruited plain, our ability to grow crops and produce different things, I, doubt, I, can't, I can't imagine under what circumstance, short of nuclear, nuclear uh, uh, problems, now God can do anything, but short of that, there'll always be plenty of bread and water and we'll open our refrigerators and go to our cupboards and we'll, we'll do just fine. So that's not the problem. The problem is of hearing the words of the Lord. This is the challenge put before this church tonight that I want to leave you with. I want to leave you encouraged. I don't want to be a downer. <laughs> I thought, I need to get something that will really, you know. And, but I hope that this challenge will leave us on a high note with hope and expectation and renewed vision and determination. And what will happen because of that, the end result of that, the absence of hearing the words of the Lord... Then they shall wander from sea to sea, and from north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and they shall not find it. Now, we're living in a time where religion is plastered, broadcast everywhere. The pro but it's not the word of the Lord. And even when it is quoted correctly, it is taken out of concept, out of context. It is misapplied inappropriately, and the standard to which it would change lives is substandard by those who preach it, teach it, organize it, and ask people to come and listen to it. I won't get into that. And so our young people are at risk of finding what we have had all of our life. Now, I know we don't want that to happen here. I can't imagine under what circumstance it ever would. But in the broadest sense, your children, not all of them, will remain in Newark. I, am, I'm, I, I assume they may, but you know how it goes. They marry, they, they carry on, they get careers and different things. And so for their generation, this is my concern tonight in verse number 13. In that day shall the young women and the young men faint for thirst. We are in the threshold. We may have crossed it. Where a generation now of young people are thirsty for truth. Now they may not even know it. And they may be thirsty and they don't even know what for. But given the circumstances and the way things have unfolded and the way things are done, it would behoove us to make very sure that this church and its ministries are at the very core and the very center of our life. I challenge every mom and dad here that has kids at home, this church and its organized services must be the, if not the single, one of the highest priorities in your home. Now, I'm leaving after this service, so you don't need to ask me to leave. I'm gone. 
And this church and its ministries and what it can afford your children ought to be more important than anything else you would encourage or allow them to be involved in. And parents need to start with an example by coming to the house of God rather than going to a Walmart or a shopping mall when the church doors are open. Parents need to bring their kids to the church house when they're open rather than letting them play ball. Oh man, we're glad you're leaving. I have had to fight this all of my life. All of my life, the church. And, and I'll tell you another thing. The Super Bowl, the Super Bowl on Sunday night, and how many people, shame, I'll just say, shame on you if the church doors were opened on Super Bowl Sunday and you stayed home to watch that ball game. You have sent a mixed message, you do an injustice to your children when you do such things. I love you, but you need to consider we're on the threshold, we're on the precipice, we may have very well put our big toe on the inside of this thing where our young men and young women are failing, they're thirsty for truth. And will they find it when we're gone? We're living in perilous times, I believe, according to what the writer said. And in those days and in that day, many things will happen, the least of which is not a falling away. There's no longer the appetite for the things of God that there once was. It just isn't. I know in the, in the secular world, I know in a religious world, but even, listen, even in the church of God, it's getting tougher and tougher. I know at home, I am just appalled at the attendance of our people. It's nothing for them to come one out of three Sundays. It's nothing to miss one or two or three or four and finally show up. I like to never not to have known half of them. I've only been there a year and I still don't know half their names because they ain't been there long enough for me to know who they are. <laughs> As far as I'm concerned, we have visitors every Sunday. Looks like to me. <laughs> Bless their hearts. Jeremiah chapter 5 says this, A wonderful and horrible thing is committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rule by their means. And my people love to have it so. And what will you do in the end thereof? You see, there's a lot of people, it'd be just as easy for them, and a lot of them do, they'll just go on down the road. You may be fighting that battle in your heart tonight. Maybe you're up a myth tree. Maybe you're upset with this pastor. Maybe you're a little angry with associates. Maybe you don't agree with some family member. Maybe, maybe you just don't like something. Well, be careful where you land if you leave this place. Because all things, I'll tell you, without bragging, without, uh, without being holier than anybody else, but all things are not equal. And there's a lot of churches that are willing to do just about anything to get you to come their way. And a wonderful, not wonderful in a sense that, hey, this is the greatest thing since the blueberry muffin. No, wonderful as in amazing. He's shell-shocked. What's committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. I marvel that many people can't see through the shallowness of what's being taught and what's being preached and what's going out today. And I encourage every parent to, to, to keep your children close to you and close to this church. You're very fortunate you have many kids here and some on the way, <laughs> at least one. And it's a wonderful thing to have young people, but it's a grave responsibility. We cannot take these young people for granted and operate under the assumption that we can do whatever we want, have half-baked convictions about church, 
and the things we allow them to be involved in, the things that we're involved in, the things that come into our home, the choices we make, the, the attitudes we have, the words that we use, the places we go, the entertainment uh, that we drag them to, and any number of things, we can't take it for granted that they'll ever want to come to this place as you did because the further away from God one generation gets, the next one gets even colder. And they'll drift even further. And I know that Brother Bartlett has a great burden for this congregation. He's committed his life to it, you know that. But it can be frustrating, and he has not talked to me. Him and I, he, he, he would never do that. I don't have to ask him to do that. The first time I ever came here, he never whispered a thing about anything going on in this congregation. And this one is no different. I don't want to know. I don't want to be swayed. I don't want to know in my mind that if things are brought up, that he's been bending my ear and whispering in my ear, and now you're hearing what he wants me to tell you. I don't operate that, and neither does he. But I know that the problems that you, the, the challenges that you face are common to every congregation where the truth is, is, uh, is preached. Because the devil, the devil hates you people. Now, on the one hand, I go, what? Do, do I care? Well, no, really, I don't. I know he's the accuser of the saints. I don't want the devil to be my friend. I know he'll never love me. I, I'm not going to lose any sleep over that. But we need to recognize what's behind that. Because of his visceral hatred, his demonic hatred for this congregation, he's going to do anything and everything he can, one individual, one family, one group at a time, to make sure that what you have known historically will dissolve for the future. I wonder if the 60s, 70s, and 80-somethings were to come back just 10 years from now, would they recognize this church? You say, I don't appreciate you in that implication. I'm not suggesting you're headed that way. We have to be on guard because the devil and the, the spirit of the age, the demonic forces that have been unleashed, and then religion that's getting on board with all of that to come against you. You know what? Everything you do around here is so traditional, most people don't want anything to do with you. Now you better, you just might as well accept that and embrace that. The only thing you've got going for you, they don't want your traditional music. They don't want your testifying. They don't want the way you do things around here. I know for a fact. I've talked to people. I've talked to these guys. They think that the way you do things around here is outdated, outmoded, archaic, and there's no place in the 21st century for a church that worships this way. But the thing that you've got going for you that proves them wrong and can very well attract people. And the reason I'm preaching this message in order you might protect it is the Spirit of God is in this place. You lose that, you'll not survive. You'll never survive. If you don't live right, carry a burden, have a vision, pray. And do what Paul said, present yourselves a living sacrifice and form the kind of convictions that will put you in this place where that you can hear the word of God. While you've got preachers that are preaching the word of God and teachers that are teaching it and singers that are singing it to preserve the integrity of this congregation for generations to come. And the only way you can do that is to ensure the presence of God. Most people wouldn't, wouldn't recognize the Spirit of God if it was visible and walked up to them and slapped them in the face. I so much appreciate when I come here the sensitivity that you folks have to the Holy Spirit and the allowance with which the Holy Spirit works in these services. The tears that flow, the hands that are raised, the prayers that are offered up. It's a wonderful thing, and it's refreshing to see it. Because again, 
You are the exception. You are not the rule. And so the devil wants to take and get your young people to become unconcerned in their own right, I suppose, and complacent to whatever they understand that, not like going to church much anymore and this, that, and the other. All my friends are going to a church. They got 3,000 people, all kinds of programs. They do this, they do that. They go everywhere. They do everything. They do anything. And they got music where you stand and this, that, and the other and all kinds of stuff. I'm glad one of the defining differences in this church is that you don't get people to come here to entertain them. You don't get people here to entertain them. The greatest craze in the religious movement today is to get people with the kind of talent and the kind of dress code and the kind of music that moves, hear me now, that touches, communicates, and reaches the carnal side of the individual. But here, you people do everything you can to ensure that the Spirit of God is felt through what you preach and what you teach and what you sing. And we need to be careful that we don't put that at risk. When we get complacent, when we take it for granted, when we can take it or leave it, when we rebel, when we get mad, when we get miffed, when we start fighting and have infightings and your pastor's more busy putting out fires than he is trying to light one in his pulpit, you're going to be in trouble. So I don't know what's going on, see. Hope nothing. But Matthew 23 verse 37 says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chicken under her wings, and you would not. Let's change that just a little bit for the 21st century. If Jesus was overlooking uh, Newark or uh, <clears throat> Jacksonville, North Carolina, or just America, it's really overlooking America, go like this. America, America, thou that shunnest the prophets, and ignore them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thee? And you would not. We are as a nation in our religion no different than Israel and the era of the crucifixion of Christ. We are self-absorbed, self-willed, and self-centered when it comes to our church services and our worship. And it's all about me. It's all about me. It's all about me. Oh, they say it's worshiping the Lord and it's about him and all of that. But really, it's about entertaining me and getting me with an emotional experience. Let me tell you something. Never, 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 ever believe that being emotional is being spiritual. <laughs> You can, you can cry until you go blind, and that won't make you close to God. You can sob until you can't stand and faint away, and you'll be no closer to God than before you shed the first tear. But today, people are being wooed away because they equate emotionalism with spiritualism. And the manifestation of that is the life lived in the community. The loss of holiness, the loss of a godly example, the loss of the standard of living has been washed from the landscape and removed from the fabric of Judeo-Christianity because of this emotionalism. And parents, if you don't hold your kids' feet to the fire with the doctrines that are in this church and the grandparents and a great-grandparent, you run the risk that when they get old enough, they'll run away.
I don't know how long I have to live, but if I come back in 10 years and the 10 year olds are 20, the 15s are 25, I want to see them here holding their hands, shedding their tears, singing your songs and theirs, bending their knees, weeping on this altar and answering the call to their own ministry. But will they have that chance if we don't maintain the integrity of the spiritual framework within this church that we've come to adhere to, admire, respect, rejoice, and enjoy when we come to this place? There's a price to be paid for it, and it's not mediocrity. And so we find that where we really are tonight is found in some of the saddest scripture in, in, in God's holy writ. At least it does to me. From the 137th Psalm, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. We wept when we remembered Zion. I pray to God that at some point in the future, there's not a lot of tears being shed because we remember what we had and now what we've lost. It's wonderful to cry for what we have and it still remains intact. It's wonderful to sometimes whack nostalgic over the names that are revered around here and our predecessors who paid the sacrifice and laid the groundwork that we can enjoy the things of God in this place that we do today. But will we give that to those who follow after us? Or will we wake up one day, the ones that remain of the generation coming up, when we look back and we remember Zion, it says that they hung their harps upon the willows in the midst thereof, for they that carried us away captured required us of, of us a song, and they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Now you say, what's that got to do with anything? As long as time remains intact as we know it to be. As long as God is still merciful and doesn't bring humanity before the judgment bar of God. There will always be a need for Zion. And in the right place at the right time, tempered by conviction... A wooing of the Holy Spirit, we need to be in a position in this community, in this neighborhood, in this place, where when people come in here and would want what to get what they need, would want to hear what they must find, it will be our responsibility to ensure that we can sing the song of Zion and we're not hung our harps in the willows. Many churches have. Many churches have compromised until they make an effort to do things and they have religious activity. They have all the vernacular, the terminology, a fair amount of the theology and their doctrine. The problem is even if it's correct, which that's another story, it's not tempered by the Spirit of God. God's not welcome in most churches. You know why? There's a price for that. Either to have it there in the first place, but when he comes, we don't want God to do anything to us. We want God. Listen, there's a difference between us wanting God to do things for us but we don't want God to mack us, nor desire of us to do much for Him. 
We want God's blessings, and all we want to do in return is bless God. We want God to open up the doors of heaven, but we don't want to come where we can hear the true message about heaven and what it takes to get there. We have traded off truth for compromise. The spirit for emotion. We have decided that no longer, and I have observed over a lifetime in my ministry, and I'm old enough now to be a, not just a casual, but know what I'm talking about. One of the biggest challenges in the Church of God movement has been this. We're not taken seriously. We don't run with the big dogs. Most of us, most people, most religions think that we're not worthy of even taking note of. And so we just kind of go our long, and a lot of preachers kind of got to thinking, I'm tired of being small. I'm tired of not having the respect that the uptown church has. I'm tired of not being dignified. I'm, not t I'm tired of the accolades and being recognized for who I am and what I am and what I'm doing around here in this community. So they decided they'd just kind of change a few things around there. And they'd get a little worldly and compromise, and sure enough, people started showing up. And they started building them works just a little more. And the bigger the congregation got, the bigger the preacher got. He began to puff up and think of somebody. But then when push comes to shove, come to find out, their harps were hanging in the willow trees. And people weren't coming and getting saved. People were coming and getting religious. We can get America to the grave. Patting them on the head. Improving of their lifestyle for the most part. Tweaking their morality just a tad. Getting them to sign on, sign up. Using them. All kinds of ways to do it. But when it comes to the truth... When it comes to the way you do things around here, oh, I know the Bible says it's for whosoever will. But what you do around here, not for everybody. It is not for everybody. It is if they want to, but most of them don't want to. Most of them don't want to. That's exactly right. And I believe tonight that the blessings of God resides on this congregation. I've been here enough to know that you have the things in place whether they're not only where they need to be. That is not to say that Brother Bartlett doesn't have some burdens and some notions and some ideas and some things that need to be taken on or addressed or some challenges, but for the most part, you are this week what you were when I came about three years ago. My point, though, tonight is you can't be so naive as to think this will always remain this way without vigilance, without renewed dedication, and the sacrifice required beginning with more than our elderly people to keep it intact. I love every young person here, every young mom and dad with children. But you need to catch on. Take hold. Everything's at risk. Our, the morality in this country has gone down a rat hole. There's little, if any, respect in the political realm. The name-calling, the abuse of each other and one another... What we hear on television that's said about the leadership, an individual, the local voting block would have called their senator, their representative, home for such behavior that we hear. And the culture of drugs and alcohol and pornography, the sin that is rampant, everything... Our country is being devoured. And you people are the last bastion of hope. 
illustrate it this way. Look at it this way. People are speeding down the highway at breakneck speed headed for their eternity. The bridge is out. This church are the only ones, along with the church of God universal, of the same presence and frame of mind, we are the only ones that can recognize the bridge is out. And we must, we must be able to step out and do everything we can to wave them down because no one else will do it. They don't know the bridge is out. You people have the spiritual astuteness. You have the awareness. God has quickened and made alive your spirit. And under the leadership and the ministry and all things that are a part of this church, all you have to do is maintain. All you have to do is ensure that you do everything you've always done in order that the Spirit of God is in this place. If you don't, and he's gone, this work is over. Now, we don't want that. I know you don't. And my hope lies in the fact that there's enough of God in this place and the Spirit that it deals with hearts. And the devil's going to come against this church. He has in times past, I'm sure. Most ministries succeed and go on and they're, they're ill affected by a few but a, occasionally someone gets miffed and leaves but, but over the years in the church of God man we have had enemies and they've not been a few but that's because the devil hates us and if he can take the church of God down then man he's taken all hope for humanity away we set the bar now when I say we that is the Bible that we, we embrace and the truths that we teach. And I wonder tonight, with all that's at stake, with all we stand to lose, I'm speaking to probably the younger crowd a little bit now. Do you have the wherewithal? Do you have the desire? Can you have within you the grit? To do what is necessary and what has been done as a model and example before you in your lifetime. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm just going to tell you what happened to me. In closing, I'll, I'll tell you what, what can happen to a church in a millisecond of time, it would seem. There's really two things that affected what happened and what I'm about to tell you, but in November of 2011, I had been at the church where I'd been preaching at that time and felt like I needed to tender my resignation. I was six months of being there for 25 years. My resignation wasn't under duress. I was not demanded, commanded, a petition hadn't been circulated, and I was asked to leave. I felt like, for a number of reasons, that my time was done. I had done everything I could. I could have stayed and would have stayed, but I felt like I can't violate God's will. I really feel I need to move on. If I'd had my way, I'd, I'd be there tonight. I'd still be there. Well, I'd be here for a while, but I'd still be there pastoring. So I resigned that church. Little did I know what was about to unfold. When I resigned, I had a number of young people come up to me and say, Mike, the only reason we stayed is out of respect for you and 
your ministry, and we stayed, but we'll be leaving too. I said, really? Oh, yeah, they said. You know where they ended up? They ended up in churches in the area. They've joined them. <laughs> They've turned to emotionalism. And they're posting things on the Internet doctrinally that are foreign to the church of God teaching that some of them I taught from their infancy up. By the time I left, the end of January, three trustees had resigned, the treasurer resigned, Sunday school superintendent resigned, four Sunday school teachers were gone. The musicians said we're leaving. It was unbelievable. Part of it was an undercurrent that was in the church that could have been staved off. They had the power, they had the numbers, they could have done, but you see, they wanted something else. They wanted what I'm telling you, never ever fall for. And young and old alike, they decided, we want what everybody else is going after. There must be something to it. And that church that I went to in 1987 with less than 20 people, when I resigned, it was running between 150 and 175 people. God built that church. And this was a church that was way out in the country. I mean, it was in the rolling hills of Bedford County, Virginia. And the last I talked to one of the people who remained, a dear little saint of God, she got nowhere to go. They're, they're back down to less than 20 people. Can't get anybody to come, barely keeping the doors open, don't hardly have the money to do anything, much less pay a preacher. My heart is so broken. My heart is so heavy for that church I told Debbie recently. If God calls me and God allows me, I'm going back. I'm going back. Don't know that I could ever bring it back to its former glory. God, not me, but I mean God using me. Don't know. Doubt it. Most people wouldn't come back, but those few that remain. You see the devil, the devil has just wreaked havoc. And it can happen in a moment. Don't ever stay to this church. And when Brother Tony passes away, well, I'm gone now. When Sherm steps down, well, the music ain't going to be the same. I'm gone now. You ain't got much. You ain't got much if that's the reason for your sticking around here. Or when Grandma's gone, well, old Grandma, I stayed for, to respect her, but she won't know the difference now, so I'm headed down the road too. You get a hold of God and know one thing. You'll never find, you'll be hard-pressed to find down the road what you've got here in this glorious church of the living God because it is the Spirit of God. That compels people to come in and come down and God's people to remain faithful to this ministry. And I hope tonight, the teenagers, you dig in. You dig in. Don't you fall for what every other kid's falling for up and down the road that's religion. You fall in love and learn to appreciate what you have in this great place. Mom and dad, keep your kids in this place when the doors are open. Get them involved in the youth programs. Get them involved in Sunday school. Keep them, get them here on Wednesday night. Get them when they're old enough. Did you notice? You were sure you noticed. Did you see all them young ladies in that choir tonight? Oh, what a blessing. What a blessing. And I'll say, I don't know how you're doing it and how you're getting it done around here, but I got to tell you, the dress code with your young people is above average for most churches, too. Now, you ought to feel good when I leave because I'm bragging on you so much tonight. <laughs> but I'm an outsider looking in, and it's true. 
And I recognize it's not put on, it's not legalism, it's not demanded, it's not mandated. You're not forced to do it. All the parents might say, no, honey, this is kind of, you know, this is what mom and dad would like you to do. And so the kids do it. Most kids are like I was when I went to school. I was too old to wear rubber boots to, to, the, to, the, to, to school. And I was embarrassed to show up with boots on in Michigan, men's snowfall. And so my mom would make me wear She said, you're going to wear them boots. So I'd stop on the, way to, on the way to the school, and there was a little gas station with an old guy, and I said, I, I can't remember his name, but I said, can I leave my boots here? <laughs> you think of that. I'd take them boots off, tuck them in the corner of the bathroom, go to school, come back, and before I got home, two blocks from home, I'd get them boots on. My mom never knew the difference. <laughs> That's bad. What, what, a, what, a, what an egomaniac. But I wanted to peer pressure, see, I'd rather show up with my shoes that had salt marks on them from the snow and my socks soaking wet and my toes frostbit than to have rubber boots on. Now that's a normal thing for a kid. But in a church where the Spirit of God is real, they'll catch on. They won't have to live mom and dad's convictions because mom and dad make them. They'll live them because the Holy Spirit has begun to deal with them on their own convictions. And it is in that moment of time and through the course of time, they will become great men and women in this local church of God. And so I want to say in my leaving tonight, that I have greatest respect and admiration for this congregation. And I love it tonight as sure as the first time I ever set foot in this pulpit. And I don't want to see it lost. I'm not suggesting it's going to be. But Brother Tony, have you ever went back to a church and it's just not the same? <laughs> And so tonight, would you stand with me as a song leader and piano player come back? And Father, we would ask that your richest blessings be upon this church. And that the famine that has come to this land, the spiritual famine that is sweeping across this nation, and is having an indelible impact on our young people, I pray that in this community, this church, as it continues to live out the truth and preach it, that increasingly parents would step up and form convictions that would cause them to realize that if there's any hope for our family, much less the community and our nation as a whole, we need more than just the Licking County Church of God, to capture this vision. We need churches across America to quit pandering to their flesh, quit reaching out to the world, quit compromising and stepping back and stepping away from your word and your truth, and have the courage and the boldness to look the devil and the world and what's popular in the face and said, we'll have none of that around here. We're not going to hang our harps up. We're going to play them. We're going to sing the songs of Zion. We're going to have something that when people come this place and they need to hear what we have, we'll be able to share it with them. I thank you, God, for this church's history. I thank you for her dedication and all the sacrifices that's been made and continue to be made in order to keep this work sound and viable in the 21st century. And I pray that they'll not grow weary in well-doing. We know we'll reap if we faint not, but Lord, sometimes we grow frustrated. We get hurt. And when those that do the things they do, we feel betrayed. The devil would try to make us angry and quite possibly lash out. Father, come what may, come what will. 
will be the church of God still. We pray that you'll further encourage and strengthen every member of this congregation. Bless brother and sister Bartlett, their associates. I pray God that you would just use them and every other resource they have in this congregation until it, Lord, they don't have revival in a sense that it's on a calendar a couple times a year. But this church will know and it will visit, be visited on the community, a sweeping revival, a supernatural spiritual awakening that is stemming from the good people here in this congregation. We've learned to love them and appreciate all that they mean to the kingdom and this community in our own life and our own ministry. We pray, Father, that no harm would befall them, the devil would be kept at bay, and that, Lord, the victories would be many and the souls would be tremendous. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Number 161, 161. Have thine own way. Have thine own way. To this work. Thou Unequivocally. The dedicated to this work and the ministries here and to your family until that this can be preserved for generations to come we can take it for granted we can take advantage of it we can assume incorrectly that it will always be here but you play a role They need every one of us to fulfill our call and our gifting. Last time I'll say anything in this service and before I go home again. Would you like to for just a second? I don't do this often. I'm sure it's like you're out. Thank you. 
come if you raised your hand. And if you didn't, come anyway. God knows your heart. You know where you are. Have I gone away, Lord? Have I gone away? Thank God for the moving tonight in the lives of some here tonight. They're going to step up. Search me and try. Another portion of this congregation that will strengthen us. Master. Today, whiter than snow. God having his own way with you tonight. Wash me just or is God going to let you have your Thank God for the message tonight. Amen. I've thought often from the time that I got saved even to this very night about how important our example is. And I don't know that we can even put enough weight on that to even realize how significant it is. Uh, there was many times along my walk that I realized that there was people had misrepresented God to me in my life. I didn't, I didn't recognize uh, the God that I read about when I looked at, at people's lives around me. Some of those that called themselves Christians. That is not what we want to do. What we've got, amen, and, and I'm thankful for the accolades that uh, Brother Worley gave for the church tonight. But what we've got is because of God, amen. And it will only be and will only continue because of God. Amen. And we have a great deal of responsibility in our lives to make sure that we're lifting up not, not our standard, but yet God's standard. Amen. And I was thinking, you know, there's, I've been in some emotional services and there's nothing wrong with, with, with an emotional service at times. But, uh, but, but it's the spirit of God that changes lives. Uh, you can be emotional for a night and walk away and be the same that you was when you walked in the door. But when, when the Spirit of God moves, amen, the world has traded in emotionalism for spiritualism. And there's a big difference between the two, amen. And we've got a thirst for that and continue to hunger for that. And I was, yeah, there's so many things I was thinking about as Brother Worley was preaching. I, I, I really, I feel the weight as a father. Uh, to make sure that I'm setting an example to my kids. I mean, what I'm going, what I tell my kids about the importance of church and then what I live in front of them is vitally important. It's not a do as I say, not as I do. Amen. That's not the mentality. You've ever heard that saying, do as I say, not as I, that is not the mentality at all. But, but I've got to, I've got to be doing what it is that I'm saying. Amen. If I'm really going to set forth an example. If we're going to raise up a generation after us that's going to cling to this truth that we love so much, amen, uh, we have got the utmost, amen, greatest responsibility in our land. And so many people, church, uh, we recognize that so many are going different directions. And just because the masses are swarming in a different direction don't mean it's right. Amen. Amen. You can surround yourself with a lot of people that'll agree with you. Man, when I was in sin, I had a lot of people patting me on the back. When I was in sin, I had a lot of people that was right there with me that were not telling me what I was doing was wrong. You can find a whole group of people that will agree with you, but that don't make it right. Amen. I even remember Christ, as the word says, there was a time when Christ looked at his disciples and a mass of people had left and he looked at his disciples and said, are, are you going to leave too? Church, just, just hold on, amen? Hold on to what we've got. God has given us the best, amen? And there's, uh, as the world would love to, to try to uh, lure you around the corner, I can tell you today, 
But I can tell you today, we've got it good. Hallelujah. Thankful that it's that way. Really appreciate the message tonight, brother. All, all the messages this that have been fantastic from Sunday morning all the way till tonight. And so we're very grateful for that. Listen, we're gonna we're gonna close out with a word of prayer. I want to continue to remember some of these that are at the altar, some of these needs that were mentioned tonight. Brother Worley will be leaving uh, first thing in the morning, and so I know he would definitely appreciate you praying for him, praying for his travels. Uh, also, Brother Randy Montgomery will be coming in. Uh, so you guys remember him, remember the services. Listen, we're going to be here uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, 7 o'clock. So make sure that you're coming out, bring somebody with you. And then our Sunday services will be as they usually are. Listen, I'm going to tell you something, church. This is a, an important time. Uh, we, we just don't know what's ahead of us as, as a nation. Uh, he touched on some scripture there tonight that ought to, ought to remind us. We're, 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 thank God for this time of mercy. Amen? Thank God for this time of mercy that we can, that we can do what we're doing right now. Amen? We're, we're thriving in many different ways. But I'm going to tell you what. Uh, we have to take advantage of that. Amen? And so with, uh, with great blessing, there's great responsibility. Hallelujah. So let us be faithful to the things of God. Amen? Yes. Come on, Pastor. Yeah, absolutely. You don't have to ask my permission. <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. John says in a revelation, when I opened the fifth seal, <clears throat> I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And we're talking about through the dark ages here, 55, 60 million Christians. And they cried with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. After the reign of Roman Catholicism, after 55, 60 million Christians were martyred for their testimony and for the word of God, then rose up another beast. It looked like a lamb, but it spake like a dragon. And then man-made religion came alive. Martin Luther and those guys, the reformers, their hearts were in the right place, but they're followers. And they put armies on the battlefield. And man-made religion rose up and another eight million were slaughtered. Right. And listen to the, how the apostasy is explained here. And I want to make a point. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black. When the sun was up, men got scorched in the parable. We're talking about the word of God. The book starting to close. Man-made religion. Man-made theology. And the moon became his blood. And the stars of the heaven fell under the earth. Revelation 1 tell you, tell you who the stars are. They're the ministers. And a great apostasy. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it had rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Now listen. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man. The, these are titles given in Revelation, the 1870, talking about Babylon. This is a picture of the leaders of man-made religion. And every free man, and, and, and they all hid themselves. They hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. When this apostasy hit, men started hiding themselves. 
in the dens and in the mountains. The Bible talks about Mount Zion, which is established in the top of the mountains. But here's religious people hiding themselves in their man-made religions, convincing themselves, I'm a this and I'm a that. I'm a member of this church. I'm a member of that church. I'm saved. And said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come. This is not talking about the end of the world. It's talking about when the morning time church caught up with itself during the 1800s and beyond, and men started to come out of Babylon, and judgment was being preached again on man-made religions and false doctrines, and they hid themselves, and, and when the wrath of God, this is just the angels going through the meridian preaching the truth. We heard from one of God's angels tonight. And what was he doing? He was calling religious people out of systems of religion where they really, and I know some are saved, but in the context of the text, many people are hiding under the labels of their churches and their doctrines. And I have asked people 50 times, are you saved? I'm a this and I'm a that. And I go here and I go there. And I was baptized 30 years ago. And God's, God's men and, and the prophet said, in that day I'm going to send forth the hunters. And they're going to hunt you out of the rocks and the crevices and the mountains. And what God is doing today is trying to get people out of religion, which has become an awful business today in our culture, and bring them back to the truth. And you know this is not heaven because the seventh seal doesn't open until chapter two chapters later. Thank God for hunting. Thank God for digging us, preaching to us, and making sure that what we're hiding, and let me tell you something, God's people don't hide. That's right. That's nothing to hide from. The people that are hiding are the people that are not living right, but they've got big religious names. Right. All right? And they receive the mark of the beast. Right. And it's in the forehead. And it's in the right hand. Right? Right? Thank God for the truth. And I want to tell you something. This is another message that's not being preached hardly anywhere today. But it needs to be preached. Not everything that glitters is gold. Did I give you that sheet? Oh, okay. Now I'm happy. Thank you. I'm just appreciating the truth. Amen. And thanking God that we've got hunters and fishers yes. and people that will come and preach the truth. And not in a derogatory way, not in an insulting or demeaning way, but letting people who are hiding in all the rocks and the dens and the crevices of false religion and putting their soul's welfare in the fact that they're joined this church and joined that church. Thank God for the truth. Amen. Share one more thought before I share this. That I, I was just as Brother Tony was speaking there. You know it. It's uh, where where would you want to be in church at? You know, I, I know for myself, I want to make heaven my home. Amen. I, I want to be I want to be right in the eyes of God, and I and I want to be usable. And and I know that the only way that's going to happen is when I submit my life to the Lord. I, I want to be wherever I go that God can hedge about me. 
Meaning if I'm not where I need to be at, I want God to draw me in. Amen. I don't want to go somewhere that will put out a false umbrella and tell me that I'm all right when I'm not. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes. All right. Also, the love offering tonight was $1,800.20. So thank the Lord for that, each one that gave. So uh, God bless you on that. Listen, we're going to have a word of prayer. We're going to pray for Brother Worley, uh, Brother Montgomery. Pray for our services the rest of the week. Again, invite somebody out. Uh, if you have Facebook, also share these services as well. Uh, it gets, gets it in front of more people. So if you have the opportunity, make sure you share our services. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we want to thank you again tonight, Father, for your word, for the truth, Lord God. We're thankful, Lord, for the, uh, for the minister of the hour tonight, Lord God, Father, and his faithfulness, Lord, to preach the gospel. Well, God, I pray tonight, Father, as we uh, sit under the load of responsibility tonight, Lord, recognizing, God, uh, what's going on in the world and, and in much of the religious world today, Father, and then what you've entrusted us with uh, right here in this congregation. Father, help us, Lord, as we move forward in the future, Lord God, that we would indeed, Lord, continue to hold to the standard of your word, Lord God, and, Father, that we would be a light, Father, uh, wherever we go and in whatever we do. Help us, Lord, as parents, as grandparents, Lord God, that in our homes, Lord, what, that we would, uh, Lord, not just wait to come to church to teach them something, but, Lord God, each and every day, Lord, that we would be sowing seed of truth into their lives. God, we thank you tonight, and we appreciate you, Father. We pray for Brother Worley tomorrow as he'll be traveling. Oh, God, we pray your hand upon it uh, as he's going down the road, God, that you just keep him safe all the way home, Lord. We pray for his family, the church there. And, Lord God, we pray for Montgomery, uh, Brother Montgomery that will be here uh, through the rest of the week. God, we pray for the services. God, we're so thankful for what we've enjoyed thus far. But I know you're not done, Father. So we pray and just ask you, Lord God, to anoint us, our hearts, our minds, our ears. Give us the strength we need uh, in our physical bodies, Lord God. And, and then, Father, spiritually, Lord, that you prepare us to receive what you have for us. Father, we thank you. We appreciate you, Lord. We love you, Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow night.